afternoon. I don't know if we have any visitors here, just in case. I'm still Professor Schreier, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture by our very distinguished guest, Sasha Denisova, whom I'll introduce shortly. I also want to tell you that uh, we should recognize all the great work that uh, our colleague, Professor Kurt Wilheiser put into this. In fact, let's give him a round of applause because it was his idea to bring Dr. here, was his project. And uh, Kurt, we're all very grateful. I also want to welcome our colleague, Professor Tony Lin, who, I don't know if some of you know, teaches a course on Russian drama. So consider this uh, um, a form. Kurt, uh, maybe not all the way. Kurt? Oh. Um, yeah, good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Consider as a form of advanced advertising. In any case, um, as you know, in this course, we are chronologically now in the mid 1920s, uh, and we just studied Mayakovsky, and we are in the middle of Shklovsky's Tsor. And also, as you know, one of the leitmotifs of this course is the idea that Russianness is not a transparent homogeneous category. We complicate the idea of cultural Russianness in many different ways. And I think Sasha embodies these complexities simultaneously as a Ukrainian writing in Russian, as an exile living now in Warsaw, and is someone who is deeply connected with uh, the various political entanglements that define today's climate of uh, cultural production in the Russian language, both in Putin's regime and abroad. As you might have guessed, Sasha Denisova is a playwright, a director, and a writer. She was born in Kiev. She graduated from the philology department of Kiev Taras Shevchenko University and subsequently studied theater and worked at various theater companies in Russia. While residing in Russia, she studied documentary theater. And I want you to make a mental note about it documentary theater. In uh, Moscow, also trained at uh, Royal Court in London, and graduated from the School of Theater Theater, a program run by the Moscow Art Theater School. When we talked about Chuck, we touched on uh, the beginnings of uh, the Moscow Art Theater. She subsequently served, and again, it's very important to make note of these transitions, because some of these things practically are unthinkable in today's climate of Russia's war in Ukraine. She served as deputy artistic director at the Mayakovsky Theater in Moscow. It was a prominent theater when I was growing up, uh, and also as chief dramaturg at the Meyerhold Center in Moscow. Sasha's plate, Light My Fire, was awarded Russia's highest theater prize, the Golden Mask, in 2012. As a playwright and director, Sasha produced more than 25 performances at Moscow stages and abroad. I'll just mention some of the plays that she was involved with, The Dusty Day, Alice and the State, Hotel California, Sea Pines, and I think my favorite title, Batman versus Brezhnev. Right, that's uh, great. Sasha makes, continues to make sharply social political theater in which documentary material merges with magical and fantastical. Now, as you already know, Sasha fled Moscow for Poland immediately after the outbreak of uh, the current ongoing full-scale war in Ukraine. At the same time, all of Sasha's productions in Russia were shut down. Since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, she has written and staged four new plays, all of them about the war. Six ribs of anger about the fate of Ukrainian refugees in Europe. My Mom and the Full-Scale Invasion, first staged reading in Barcelona, and it is now being played at the Wilmer Theater in Philadelphia. Apparently it's sold out, and uh, I wish I could go and see it myself. Uh, and um, the play that will figure prominently in Sasha's presentation today, Gaga, The Hague, which of course has to do with the uh, International Tribunal. In The Hague, which is an account of a tribunal against Putin and his gang, that takes place in the imagination of a Ukrainian girl from Mariupol, and which Sasha also directed at the Polish theater in Poznan last February, and at the Arlequin Players Theater here in Boston. I'm really thrilled to have you, Sasha. We're so excited to hear your presentation. How this will work is Sasha will speak in Russian, 
which is the language that she and I share, and then I will uh, translate consecutively, and uh, then we'll have time for questions. Sasha, welcome. <laughs> Это сейчас коротко рассказать вам о документальном театре в России на протяжении 20 века и 21. So I will try in this brief hour to tell you about uh, Russian political theater throughout the century. В современный современный театр документальный театр в России, который занимался политическими темами, также начался 24 года назад. So to, today's political theater uh, that engages some of the themes uh, that we will be dealing with today started in Moscow 24 years ago. С помощью прибивки британского театра в <laughs> with the help of a uh, injection administered by the Royal Court Theatre from the UK. And the political theatre emerged every time when there was a feeling of dearth of uh, fictional theater on stage, and there was a acute need for the political theater. So uh, in the uh, 1990s, um, theater in uh, Russian and Moscow specifically was quite conservative, and young playwrights uh, felt a need for something new, and as a result, they invited the colleagues from Royal Court Theater to Moscow. Uh, and what is interesting that this history repeats what had happened in London, in England, in the 1950s, when the famous basement Подвал, the basement theater. Да, маленькое помещение, в котором начинался Royal Court. Они дали объявление и пришли драматурги, которые, например, среди них был Осборн, да, который написал знаковую пьесу и появилось первое поколение молодых рассерженных. И так начался сам Royal Court. So basically, Royal Court started from a basement space to which, uh, following. A, an ad, young playwrights uh, showed up, and uh, from there uh, began what eventually developed into royal court. And so basically, this tend, this tends to happen always, and this has happened previously in Russia, the idea that the most vulnerable groups are represented, are involved in this documentary of political theater. So if you were to be given tape recorders and were told to go out and record interviews with the most underrepresented, the most vulnerable, whom would you interview? Yes? Yeah. Isaiah, almost here. Yeah. It's normal. And that's what became the first performances of this sort in Russia. Yeah, and so in addition to what was a marginalized group in the UK back then, the homeless, of course, the marginalized groups in Russia of the 1990s included LGBTQ, for instance, uh, at the time. Сейчас, например, LGBT plus 
which in Putin's Russia today is referred to as a terrorist extremist organization. So these people can no longer express themselves, represent themselves in everyday life uh, and because they can no longer speak openly of who they are. They can hold hands in public because they could be for that deemed terrorists. So at first, uh, Russian theater turned to the study of what at the time was outside the boundaries of then normative behavior. Those whom society and state had forgotten, war veterans, convicts in penal colonies for men and for women. So there was a uh, performance titled Crimes of Passion, which is a little bit like the musical Chicago, in which uh, the uh, director, Barbara, Barbara Fire. Fire, studied, specifically zoomed in on women who murdered their husbands, right? Yeah, so abusive husbands, and these women now found themselves in the after murdering their abusive husbands. И параллельно это была история не только о любовных страстях, но и об устройстве российских тюрем. And so it not only became a play about crimes of passion, but also about the inner workings of the penitentiary system in Russia. И театр ДОК, который стал флагманом документального движения на ближайшие 20 лет, начиная с нулевых годов, да, в спектакле, например, которые касались идентификации LGBT+, или ВИЧ позитивных, которые тоже являлись как бы неприятной группой для государства. Да? So Theater Doc, which the so-called Theater Doc, which was at the forefront of this work, certainly uh, turned its attention to um, uh, LGBTQ, to then HIV positive uh, individuals, in general those whom Russian society treated as somehow quote-unquote unpleasant, unpresentable, uh, lying outside of this normative sphere. And so, um, of late, to these performances, they would send the police or special agent provocateurs would turn up who would be there to disrupt or derail the performances. И позже, например, когда в 2014 году началась, произошла аннексия Крыма и произошла аннексия, произошел захват Донецкой и Луганских частей областей, да, начался конфликт на Донбассе, Путин, путинские войска пошли, пошли на Донбасс, в Москве были пробы сделать спектакли о Майдане, о революции в Украине, об аннексии Крыма. So when in 2014, mm -hmm. uh, Russia annexed, illegally annexed Crimea, and then Russian troops invaded uh, Donetsk and uh, Luhansk areas of Ukraine, there were attempts in Russia to create performances about it, and they were 
Сюрприз. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. И кроме меня в этом документальном движении были украинские драматурги режиссеры, такие как Максим Курочкин, Наталья Ворожбит, Андрей Май, которые так же, как и я, учились в Москве театру. И потом в разные, в разные годы возвращались обратно в Украину. Сейчас они вернулись в Украину. So there was a group of uh, younger Ukrainian theater people of Sasha's generation who were working with her for part of this movement, and then they've all since returned to Ukraine. И когда uh, все они вернулись в Украину после 2014 года, когда стало ясно, что разговаривать в театре в Украине становится все становится невозможным. Yeah, and they all have returned since 2014 when it was becoming clearer and clearer that it was no longer possible to speak about the events in Crimea and Ukraine. И среди таких ранних попыток, если говорить о нулевых и десятых годах в России, были спектакли, конечно же, и о терроризме, например, о Беслане, да, когда была захвачена школа. Елена Гремина сделала спектакль «Сентябрь ток». So there, there was following the infamous events in Beslan in North Caucasus where a school was uh, uh, captured by uh, terrorists. Um, what was the okay. uh, Yelena Gremina. Yelena Gremina uh, did the production uh, September Dog, which dealt with the events in Beslan. Где попыталась представить в так называемой ноль позиции все, все абсолютно мнения участников противоположных сторон. Yeah, where she attempted to represent, uh, attempted to represent the positions of all different sides involved in the conflict. В том числе сторонников террористов. Including those who support it. Напомню, что была захвачена школа э, 1 сентября, да, и, и погибли дети при, при освобождении заложников. Yeah, so just as a reminder, the, what happened in Beslan was that the terrorists uh, uh, um, took a whole school, held the whole school hostage, and when uh, the um, Troops attempted to break in. Children were killed. То есть представьте себе пьесу в Америке, где где о терроризме говорят, в том числе и сами террористы. So imagine a play, a performance in America, where among those who are speaking about terrorism are the terrorists themselves. Конечно, такая пьеса вызовет неоднозначную реакцию. Of course, such a play would elicit many different responses. Когда автор не делает, автор представляет как бы в разных позициях все эти мнения, да, но не дает своего осуждения. Yeah, so when the author gives these various positions equal footing, as it were, without voicing their own opinion. Были, например, еще была пьеса Бернус Путин итальянского драматурга Дарио Фо. Она не была вполне документальной, зато, зато на сцене возникали отношения Берлускони и Путина в очень сатирической yeah. форме. So, for example, there was a play called Berlus Putin, as in Berlusconi and Putin, where on stage, the presenter on stage in the uh, as a satire were uh, relations in Putin and Berlusconi. И в этом большом документальном политическом театре, в этом большом движении, где были десятки драматургов, режиссеров, кураторов, это движение было одновременно низовым и движением энтузиастов, потому что оно не возникало на базе каких-либо бюджетов, да, оно возникало просто желание людей вместе делать какое-то дело. So this movement, which incorporated playwrights, directors, actors, different theater people, was simultaneously a grassroots movement that really did not enjoy any 
structural support was really a movement of enthusiasts from the bottom up. И таким образом создавались в этом внутри этого движения. Оно постепенно из революционного становилось мейнстримным за десятилетия. Люди переходили работать в большие государственные театры, как я, например, и приносили туда новую эстетику и новые темы. So eventually, from a revolutionary movement, this would enter the mainstream where these enthusiasts like Sasha herself would become employed by big theaters and with themselves they would bring into the mainstream a new aesthetic. Примеру, если большие консервативные театры с со сценами коробками, да, с итальянской сценой коробкой, нужно было создавать для для такой большой сцены пьесы на современное современным содержанием, да, однако учитывая форму сцены, труфу, в которой состоит как огромное количество человек, да, мы стали создавать новые пьесы для для такого театра. So basically, instead of the traditional Italian style uh, box stage, because these plays had a very large cast were numerous actors involved uh, uh, the directors and the playwrights come up with new stage solutions и идеальным как бы идеальной пилюлей да которую мог проглотить репертуарный театр было переиначивание классики and so the ideal kind of pill that the official theaters could swallow was the revamping of the classics Например, я переписала знаменитую пьесу Ипсона «Враг народа». For instance, Sasha rewrote Ibsen's famous play «Enemy of the People» by Ibsen. Как вы помните, в этой пьесе воду, так, если грубо совсем говорить, выясняется, что вода, которая лечит людей, вода лечебница, которая приносит доход в казну города, отравлена. So it turns out in the play, and this is just a kind of very good summary, uh, not my summer, Sasha's <laughs> summer. <laughs> that in this spa where people are supposed to take the curative waters, it turns out that the water is not curative but actually poisoned, and the authorities know that. И главный врач лечебницы хочет открыть городу правду, что вода отравлена. And so the um, chief physician of this uh, establishment wants to tell the people that the water is. А мэр города его брат говорит нет, тогда пострадают бюджеты и наша репутация. Whereas the mayor of this town, who is the uh, physician's brother, tells him no, you cannot do this because the budget, the budget will suffer and the reputation of the resort. И этот сюжет взял один знаменитый американский фильм и слегка переделал. And so uh, this story who was the foundation of one famous American film where it was slightly altered. I can't uh, ah, the film is called <laughs> Jaws. <laughs> yeah, so the Spielberg uh, in Jaws was looking uh, back to, to traditional dramaturgy. И таким образом я тоже переписала «Враг народа», «Он же челюсти», переписала только с учетом э, Химкинского леса. Это была история, когда защитники окружающей среды легли под выбывающей противодействием. So Sasha this way revised, revamped, in Russian, beside could mean literally rewrite, but also revise or revamp. Uh, that's editorializing, but uh, uh, revised, rewrote uh, Enemy of the People and Jaws, but it was uh, uh, actually about this famous scandal with the so-called Himki Forest. Himki is a near suburb uh, of, uh, kind of northwestern suburb of Moscow, where uh, environmental protesters, I forget, what they do? They leave with Right, so the authorities were going to bulldoze over the whole of this forest, 
and the protesters basically threw themselves under the bulldozers. И форма спектакля была как бы классической, была невероятная декорация, но содержание было современным, и экологи пришли выступать перед спектаклем. И это было новое, потому что актеры, которые работали всю жизнь в театре, они не видели никаких экологов, и никакого леса, и вообще никакой реальности. Это было для них неожиданно. The structure of the play, the staging, was traditional, whereas the contents was completely novel. And furthermore, before the performances, ecologists would speak to the audience and note also that many people in the audience had not seen the forest and generally had no sense of the ecological reality. То есть, таким образом, актеры э, театров сидели много лет в башне из слоновой кости и не понимали, что они играют. И, как бы, они играли защитника правды. Ну, какой правды? Ну, и теперь они увидели защитника леса, защитников э, леса. Да? So, for many years, uh, theater workers, actors, had been sitting, living in this ivory tower, thinking that they were representing the truth, but what kind of truth? And now they saw that actually they were defending a forest, a real forest. Да, они увидели реальных людей, среди которых были ученые физики, библиотекари, которые готовы были лечь под бульдозеры. Yeah, so they saw real people that included scientists, librarians who were prepared to put themselves, throw themselves on the ground in front of these bulldozers. Это и было приходом документального театра, политического театра в старые театры, и это было, это было вторжение реальности в старую эстетику. So that was the coming of this political theater, new theater, into the theater world. That was the invasion of the new aesthetic. И дальше театр, например, когда я работала заместителем художественного руководителя в театре Маяковского, где был этот враг народа, мы решили делать с актерами, я вела у них документальную студию, постоянно возвращая актеров к реальности. So when Sasha was deputy artistic director of the Maikovsky Theater, she taught a workshop on documentary theater, where she put it, she was consistently bringing the actors back to reality. И в частности, как вы сейчас учите Маяковского и проходите Сошковского, да, и, и, и в театре Маяковского я делала спектакль о Маяковском, о его биографии, да, Маяковский идет за сахаром, он назывался. Their name after Mayakovsky. Sasha did a production uh, about Mayakovsky, a biography which was called Mayakovsky. So Mayakovsky is buying sugar. And so the personages include Shklovsky, they also include Klebnikov. This is Lighting, but I think remember guys we talked about kind of the extreme experimental uh, part of the futurist movement and Zaum, so Kremnikov was that great genius. But the point is these people were real authors who surrounded my post. Mm -hmm. Это был спектакль сделан молодыми 20-летними актерами, и он был, собственно, для 20-летних. Uh, есть такая uh, история, что, допустим, документальный театр или uh, современный театр, он должен быть созвучен аудиторией. Да? То есть это был такой просвещенческий спектакль uh, о том, как власть и, и, и uh, власть и государство uh, губят поэта. For 20-year-olds, and there is this idea that uh, the Sasha, как тут сказали, извините, ранняя деменция, что 
идея в том, что должен быть посвященческий театр. Да, да, да. То есть, например, в европейских театрах часто спектакли делятся преступление наказания для до 14 лет это один спектакль, а после 14 лет другой. Oh, yeah. So basically that versions uh, ought to address different demographic groups versus crime and punishment for those younger than 14 and then crime and punishment for those older. Uh, and so here это был спектакль для 20 лет. This is what 20 year olds. And it's still running, strange as it may sound, and Sasha's name still appears in the credits. So how they manage to perform it is quite unclear. Я хотела сказать, что с э, актерами театра Маяковского мы стали исследовать э, э, район Москвы, который называется Сретенко. Это был спектакль, посвященный э, определенному э, району с его прошлым, с его идентификацией, с его э, э, историческим прошлым. Вот yeah. Сретенко был таким районом. And so with the troupe, with the actors, they began to explore a particular neighborhood of Moscow called Sredinka, which is an historic center where the young man spent a lot of time as an aside. And this was a kind of in-depth investigation of one particular area of Moscow, its history, its identity, its residents. Oh, so when the actors experienced uh, the verbatim experience, documentary theater, when they felt that actually it's not terrifying to deal with contemporary reality, they started going out with uh, recorders and actually talking to real people. So they did a uh, production called Decalogue, devoted to the Ten Commandments. И выяснилось, что в этом районе Сретенка, который имеет средневековое строение, в каждом из отдельных э, частей э, этого района происходил какой-нибудь один грех. Например, в этом районе убивали. Oh, so it turned out that uh, in this area, which still has medieval building structures, uh, there were areas, each of which was associated with one particular sin or crime. For instance, in one area, people would get murdered. They had uh, NKVD, Soviet secret police jails, sort of uh, satellite uh, uh, jails, which had the so-called execution bunkers. И, например, там мы искали всех, кто может подходить под эту тему и что-то рассказать об этом, и мы нашли шофера Берри, который жил там. So they looked for people who could tell something about the area and its past, and they located uh, a driver who used to drive Лаврентий Берри, who was one of Stalin's closest henchmen. He was at one point uh, Minister of uh, uh, State Security, and then even higher, uh, and so this was his personal drive. So another area had 150 former brothels, and Chekhov used to uh, be very fond of spending time there. Ни странно, нам казалось, что они были по всей Москве, это не так. Указом царя они были ограничены вот определенные кварталы с рейтинги. So they had thought that these bordellos would be all over Moscow, and it turned out it wasn't the case, and there was a special cause, a special regulation that they had to be located within a certain area of Sredinka. Еще в одном квартале торговали, там были so another area had uh, uh, market stalls, uh, so-called Sukhrivka, Sukhrivska Square. So 
And especially in the 1920s, probably both Mankowski and Chukowski go there because there you could buy or barter various things. So uh, you could get sugar or saccharine. Uh, and so this uh, area ideally yielded itself to a presentation of 10 sins. Но главное, что чем занимался документальный и политический театр, это, конечно, не, не, не просто интерес, интерес к прошлому его волновал или исторические какие-то студии, да? это всегда были ответы на актуальный вопрос сегодня. И для России болезненным было то, что не прошлое, сталинское прошлое не было проговорено и не было and, yeah, so of course, while the theater looked back to the past, it was concerned with contemporary questions. And uh, one of the things that was very painful at the time was that Stalin's past had not been properly discussed and interpreted. То есть там была, например, новелла про, про мясника сталинского, который расстреливал тысячи, тысячу и более человек в день. So there was, for instance, one novella among these ten, which was about a Stalinist butcher who, in the course of one day, would execute a thousand people. И он расстреливал в фартухе мясника, в фартух и... Yeah, and so he would carry out the executions while wearing a butcher's apron and special butcher's uh, gloves. Oh, and so the actors and Sasha went to his grave to discover that there were fresh flowers, maybe a lot of fresh flowers, which you can imagine what it means. And then they discovered his grandson. Great grandson. So he was so he was a probably ordinary kind of fashionable guy who had no idea that uh, he had such an ancestor. He thought that uh, that he had this butcher of an ancestor. He thought that he was a probably good guy. Он, он отказался с ними разговаривать, конечно. Of course, he refused to talk to them. Но я написала сцену, где встречается правнук палача и правнук жертвы. Uh, so Sasha wrote a scene in which the grandson of uh, the great grandson, apology, of the butcher and the great grandson of the victim. И о чем они могут говорить? Один ему показывает папки, твой прадед убил моего прадеда. And what could they possibly converse about? One shows him uh, a folder with his uh, great-grandfather's dossier and says, so your great-grandfather executed my great-grandfather. <laughs> So for the actors and for the audience, such a contact, immediate contact with reality was very novel mm -hmm. and painful. Yeah. And so they produced it in 2012 and uh, Bertina has been uh, it's been uh, running for 10 years, more, more than 10 years. Uh, for instance, the play titled Batman vs. Brezhnev continues to run. They removed the name of the playwright and the director and it just says playwright director no name они его не хотят снимать хотя это спектакль про тирана and they don't want to actually 
to move it, even though it deals with a tyrant. To draw it, I mean, even though it deals with a tyrant. One of the more recent Soviet leaders who ruled for 20 years. Who started the war in Afghanistan in 1979? And so there are some correspondences between him and Putin. Но это история маленькой советской девочки. Я беру свое детство. Sort of a young Soviet girl based on Sasha's own childhood. Которая принимает своего отца, который хочет быть диссидентом, хочет сражаться с режимом, но большей частью идет в ее боку. Она принимает его? Принимает за, принимает за Бэтмена. Oh, принимает so. не за э, интеллигента, который запутался в своих э, рефлексиях, да, а принимает за волшебного героя, который летает, он не пьет за водку за гаражами, а летает и ночью в плаще и борется со злом. So basically, she, this girl mistakes her father, who in reality is this member of the Soviet intelligentsia who has all sorts of good intentions, but he mostly spends his days drinking vodka behind uh, you know, these garages, but she thinks that he is Batman, this fantastical creature, through wishful thinking. It's a performance in a auditorium for 1,000 people. Там использованы мотивы американского комикса, потому что он одет как Бэтмен, он появляется под музыку из Бэтмена. And so it incorporates uh, themes from American comics, uh, and the actor is dressed like Batman. He appears to the music, uh, uh, the Batman music, and. Uh, да, только он живет вот в 80-е годы в, в Советском Союзе. Yeah, except he lives in the 1980s in the Soviet Union. I think I wrote that one of those, by the way. It's a comedy, of course. And, but of course, it's pure political theater because uh, he, the play, the character in the theater, the play, asks inconvenient questions, poses inconvenient questions. Например, такие, как хорошо вам было жить в Советском Союзе. For instance, uh, did you have a good life during the Soviet period? Uh, вспомните, какие были прекрасные песни, но у вас не было продукта. Remember what kind of great songs uh, you had, but you didn't have food. You had censorship, there were political repressions. And so by paying nostalgic tribute to the Soviet past, to its culture, to its uh, uh, cartoons, animation, it also asks these difficult questions are uh, along the lines of what are you prepared to sacrifice for the future? В итоге отец погибает, и отец погибает, и это как раз вид театра, когда сейчас я расскажу про спектакль, который идет в Америке, в Филадельфии, про мою маму. Это спектакль жанра автофикшн, когда автор использует реальную свою историю, э, скрещивая ее с фантасмагорией и, 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 и с политикой в том числе. Yeah, и это so дает ощущение правды. This play, and also the play that Sasha is going to talk about, the one that is now playing in Philadelphia, uh, which, this, uh, which is uh, called My Mom and the Full Scale Invasion, this belongs to the genre of Author fiction. So basically, these are reflections on the author's own past, which are at the intersection of historical rea reality and uh, phantasmagoric interpretations. Uh, 
То есть, если э, Брежнев, Бэтмен против Брежнева — это спектакль про, э, про отца в форме американского комикса, то «Моя мама» — это про э, войну в Украине, где э, мама, которая 82 года, э, становится ну, чем-то вроде э, военного главнокомандующего. And uh, interprets him through the lens of uh, American comics, Batman. Then this play, Mama and the Full Scale Invasion, is of course about one's mother, and in the play, one's mother is transformed into a commander, commander in chief. From the commander of the Ukrainian army, commander. So the mother becomes the commander in chief of the Ukrainian army during the Russian invasion. In other words, the point here, it's an intersection of uh, reality and a phantasmagoric interpretation. И этот спектакль вот сегодня, еще до 18 числа, он идет в Филадельфии, потом я могу уже посмотреть записи после того, как закончится прокат шоу. Yeah, so until February 18th, it's uh, running in Philadelphia, and then we will be able to see it uh, online. Да, на сайте Wilma Theater. Да, да, да. On the website of Wilma Theater in Philadelphia. Сейчас еще в наверное, да, и потом покажу что-нибудь. Хорошо. So is also going to talk about her play Gaga, Hate. Да, когда началось, началось полномасштабное вторжение, худруга польского театра предложил мне написать что-нибудь, какую-то пьесу о Путине. So when the full-scale, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began, uh, 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 an artistic director of a theater in Poland approached Sasha with the idea of writing a play. So, and she said the only play about Putin that she would like to write is a play where he is in jail, right, on trial in The Hague. Я начала писать смешные сцены, как он сидит в тюрьме, и сидят с ним еще 10 его подельников, да, его, из его российского правительства, от Кадырова до Матвиенко и Пашничева, главы бывшего главы КГБ. So basically, uh, not just Putin, but um, ten of his henchmen are all there, and they include uh, people like uh, Кадыров, Матвиенко, the former governor of uh, St. Petersburg, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, who was the one? Are you sure? Propagandist Simonian. Putin's, uh, one of Putin's leading propagandists, Simonian. Uh, so basically, it's a whole cast of henchmen, Putin's henchmen. Да, и э, эта пьеса, я ее поставила в Польше, потом поставила в Америке, в Бостоне, в Абитин Пэйсе, это в прошлом году, год назад уже. Yeah, and so last year it played here in Boston at uh, Harvard Green, uh, uh, Arlequin Players, which is a Russian uh, uh, theater. Mm -hmm. И потом она была поставлена французским режиссером в Болгарии, и сейчас шла в Тулузе, во Франции. And so then it was uh, produced by a French, uh, no, Bulgarian director. Uh, uh, by a French yeah. director in Bulgaria, and now it's running in France in Toulouse. No, if, uh, if, it depends on the political theater, about which, as I've long said, Brecht. Как раз я увидела его, как он реализован был в Болгарии, в болгарской постановке. And so this political theater, the way Bertolt Brecht spoke about Sasha saw it in the Bulgarian production. Потому что если в Америке вы не очень боитесь здесь Путина. Because if here in America you aren't particularly afraid of Putin. Вы можете немножко посмеяться над ним, когда видите его на сцене. You can laugh at him a bit when you see him on stage. Это черная комедия. Это смешно. It's kind of funny black comedy. Но в Болгарии очень сильное пророссийское влияние. Они живут за счет русских денег, русского бюджета. У них очень мощные, как это, интеллигенс, разведка и агенты путинского влияния. So whereas in Bulgaria there is a very strong Russian 
influence, a very strong pro-Putin camp. They also uh, get funding from Russia. They are also uh, agents of Putin's secret police. И когда я прилетела туда на премьеру из DC, это было похоже на шпионский детектив. And so when Sasha arrived there, she was flying from Washington DC to Bulgaria. To her, this resembled a uh, uh, spy thriller. Они сказали ни слова приводители, он про путинский. So for instance, they told her, don't speak about anything uh, while the driver is here, because he's pro Putin. Потом меня привезли на телевидение, надели на меня микрофоны, и рядом уже была украинская переводчица, которая сказала ни слова по-русски, мы говорим только на украинском, вы представитель Украины, и я сразу пришла на украинском. And then there was an interpreter uh, who represented Ukraine who said not a word in Russian because we represent Ukraine, and Sasha then switched to Ukraine. Uh, и дальше они стали ждать провокации в зале, это огромный зал на 900 мест, uh, стали ждать uh, того, что путинская, про путинская да, армия, партия будут забрасывать актеров uh, uh, да, яйцами. So like eggs, и дальше представьте себе, что на этот спектакль приходит все правительство, весь кабинет министров, глава страны, полный состав. Then imagine turning up for this performance is the whole Bulgarian government, including the cabinet, the prime minister. Полностью зал состоит из мужчин в официальной одежде и в затянутых пиджаках. So the auditorium is filled with men who are dressed very formally, and they're buttoned up, their suits are all buttoned up. And it really looked like the tribunal in the Hague. They're all really stressed and uh, kind of looking over their shoulders, and Sasha felt like she had never seen such a uh, sense of stress, pressure in the air. And then Putin comes out onto the stage. Actrisa, even though it's a female actor, an actress who has uh, uh, the Called the makeup of Putin. Yeah. Early onset. Когда Путин обращается на сцене и говорит, ну что будем делать? У нас здесь сосиски на завтра. And then Putin says, what are we going to do? We have hot dogs for breakfast here. Да, как нам выбраться отсюда? Они уже. How do we get out of here? Вся вся эта публика в зале, они начинают как-то смеяться, как на сеансе экзорцизма. Yeah, so the, the audience starts laughing like during a uh, seance of exorcism, like that, like there, basically. Because they cannot imagine that one could poke such fun at Putin when they know he's there in the Kremlin ordering the bombing of Ukraine. И тогда, как вы знаете, Пригожин, который затеял мятеж против Путина и был вскоре сбит, сбит его суперджет, и он разбился на самолете, он был там, вообще-то, если написан как живой, но тут оказалось, что он умер, и нужно было переписать эти сцены. And then there was this uh, character called Пригожин, who headed a mutiny against Putin, and then uh, he was on a plane that was shot down, so he was assassinated. So uh, when Sasha was writing the play, he was still alive, and now it turns out that he was dead, so she had to alter the play. Uh, yeah, and so she changed uh, it uh, by taking into consideration the fact that he was dead. So Stonebill was really good for some time. И режиссер позвонил и сказал, послушай, Пригожин разбился, у меня 18 актеров на сцене. So basically, yes, uh, this premiere was in September, uh, and uh, the director called her and said, look, we're we, we starting, and now this guy had been shot down, what do we do? 
И тогда я переписала, и Пригожин все время говорит, у меня алиби, я умер. Oh, and basically she changed it in such a way that this uh, man, former henchman of Putin, Пригожин, keeps saying one thing, I have an alibi, I'm dead. Uh, да, и, uh, и вот такими, и когда, uh, когда эта аудиенс болгарская, когда они понимали, что это шутки, которые только что написаны, только что написаны. And so the Bulgarian audience understood that these were jokes freshly composed. Они не могли поверить, потому что это выглядело uh, так, французский режиссер это поставил, как Шекспира. Yeah, so they couldn't believe it because this French director staged it, staged it as though it were Shakespeare. Это был практически Макбет, только очень смешной. It was practically Macbeth, but also very funny. Они не могли понять, как это может быть, как это возможно. Это же вчера произошло, и вот это на сцене в декорациях с дымом, со светом. Yeah, so they couldn't figure out how it was possible because it just happened yesterday and now it was on stage and the set was there and smoke and sounds of uh, bombs exploding. Mm -hmm. uh, Западът е този, който затрупваше Украина с уражие, докато ние търпеливо изчакахме. Западът беше този, който превърна Украина в нацистска държава, а ние наблюдавахме с тревога. От 90-те Матвиенко става вярна сратничка на Путин, а той позволява да отмъкне милиони, докато заема поста губернатор. След това изпращат в пенсия на глави съвета на федерацията и тя одобрява военното нахуване в Украина. Когато започнаха да нападат на не можехме да сме наш. Аз се превърнах в вас. Хората да ми идваха и молеха майчите Русия при гри до вас къщи. И Владимир Владимирович реши и спря това човек, която. Това е Маргарита Симоня, главният пропагандист. Всеки ден тя говори от екрана. Ние не воюваме с престъпники. Ти защо в минало време? Аз все пак оживях. Вие пък не се сърдете. Ими... Аз така по инерция. Колеги, моля ви да смятаме Евгений Викторович за пълноправен, жив член на нашия хакски колектив. Ама, той е умрял бе, но... Искаш ли сега ти да ми умреш на мене? Вие не бъдете слопаметен. Аз всичко разбирам, Владимир Владимирович, то така трябваше да стане. Аз се чудя с кой е кълът тогава трябва към Москва. Ко ми стана? Вие мен правилно ме свитахте с зенитен комплекс. Да не го хръмна на някой дух да търси справедливост в Москва. Да забравим обидите. А мен никой нищо не ни каза. Кой жив, кой умрява с през цялото време на фронта? Другарио министър, стига измишлоти ни всички знаят, че на фронта бяхме само аз и покойни Евгений Витрович. Аз съм жива, Сериона! Извинявай, аз тогава такъв бой явно заради тебе, че от тогава забравям. Ей, дайте да повисним за колективното ни оцеляване, така да се каже. Аз съм се бил на фронта и то не веднъж. Ох, бил си си Тенан Занча, но в студиото си. Ти, то си, нали приказка да ни изпълни, който си Марио по-освобождавахме то. Освобождавахте, стига, бе. Маргарита Симонян. Не можем показать уже сцену по-английски и тогда им будет понятно. Окей. Now we'll show the same scene in English. This is Bulgaria. Yeah, so that was in Bulgaria, in case you were wondering. That was not... Yes. I can breathe well. Uh, and you said that you're quite a spectacular. Why don't you speak? Да, это вы видите спектакль, он шоу в, uh, онлайн, да, то есть поэтому здесь такая э, странная история с э, э, экраном, да, это запись с экрана. Oh, so this performance, it's spectacular show online? Spectacular show и живое и онлайн. Ah, so the performance was both live and online, which is why you see this kind of fragmented screen. Так, сейчас мы... Да, чуть-чуть громче. 
Bantushuk used Devi Chok to poison traitors and even hold delegations. It was Bantushuk who for decades whispered to Putin. In Ukraine, near Russia's borders, the Anglo-Saxon deployed a network of American biolaboratories to spread viruses among Russians through migrating birds, particularly geese. We intercepted three male mothers. All three were itching a lot. And we found a dangerous virus under their plumage. Such goose flying into Russia can deprive the military of effectively making decisions. Soldier! Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a Ukrainian girl who fled from the beginning of the war, and now she is studying in cinema school in New York. She's Ukrainian. Yeah, so the um, young woman who was uh, uh, performing the role of uh, the, the, the girl, girl, she's a Ukrainian woman who now is... Uh, she, she's cute. She's, she's 16. Oh, she's 16. Yes, a young girl. So, Sasha, we have a little bit of time, but maybe you could uh, take some questions. So, guys, please uh, don't go back. This is your time to ask questions. Uh, Please. The fact that these plays are causing like so much political tension and they're getting so much of that tension, does that let you know, does that give anybody like satisfaction that let you know that these plays are working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the greatest satisfaction is that people are laughing at Putin, that you are laughing at him, that brings me, that gives him true. And the fact that my mom was an instrument of international politics, she wrote about the Washington Post, the Guardian, it was also very good. And also that uh, Sasha's mother became an instrument of international politics, that uh, the Washington Post and the Guardian write about her, that also pleases her. Yes. Please. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, sort of during the time of sort of the, the end of Gorbachev's era and during Yeltsin, how did the uh, playwriting uh, see change from, uh, during the time of the end of the USSR? Ну вот это, когда сменял, когда Ельцин сменил Горбачева, что происходило? Да, что они, да, что они но она изменилась как бы позже, потому что, как ни странно, вот только в конце 90-х театр стал, а, а, вот то, что я писала, это произошло уже в 1999 году, не раньше. И потом Путина. И в 90-х годах, когда Путин начал но какое-то время его э, театр не волновал, э, если э, цензура распространялась на телевидении очень сильно, а потом и на кино, а театр не волновал его. So for a period of time, theater did not concern Putin. So there was censorship uh, of television, of uh, cinema. But uh, theater, for a period of time, just did not consider it. And so, yeah, so until February 2022, and then basically the show was over. So those who fled, from Russia were then declared national traitors just the way they were during the Soviet 1920s. This is more or less where we are in Shklovsky's Tsoana, where he's trying to negotiate his return, and also, Sasha said, the way it was after the Nazis came to power, when those who emigrated were also declared national traitors. Uh, и, например, Женя Беркович и Света Петричук, режиссер и драматург, сидят в тюрьме уже больше полугода yeah, so of, за пьесу. Over a year, Женя Беркович и Саша Петрич, Свет, Света, Света Петричук, я извиняюсь, mm -hmm. uh, two theater directors have now been in jail for over six months in Russia. И если вы, вот, если говорить о параллели с 20-ми и с 30-ми годами, то, так, если очень коротко, uh, 
говоришь, что 20-й Майковский, Шкловский и Гладков, даже, это, условно говоря, новый тоже революционный документальный театр, когда пьесы создаются из коллажей, из газет, из чего угодно. Но в 30-е наступает перелом, и наступает рождение репертуарного театра, который связан со Сталиным. Yeah, so basically, Collage, uh, and then in the 1930s, theater returns to traditional repertory theater. And it had to do with Stalin's role as the overseer of Soviet theater. Stalin говорит, надо закрепить актеров за театрами, как за собственностью, а вы все едете на заводы. Гладков едет на завод Златоуст первый, да. Ашловский едет вообще в Беломорканал, где говорится. So basically, Stalin. Uh, orders that actors be attached to theaters, more or less like serves to land, whereas he wants the playwrights to travel to factories, to production sites, uh, including Gladkov, whom we will soon read, and others, uh, Shklovsky travels as part of this group of writers to the construction of the White Sea Canal, etc. So basically, this is the Stalinist moment. We're not there yet. Да, и Шловский едет на Беломор канал, где видит заключенных и говорит на мини реплику и чувствует себя черногурцем в пушном магазине. Шкловский travels as part of a group of writers to the construction of the uh, White Sea Canal, where he sees convicts who are building this canal, and he says, I feel the famous phrase like a live uh, polar fox in a department store. То есть главный закон документального театра, что документальный авангардный театр возникает в момент модернизма, революции, а империи всегда нужен, нужна классическая пьеса, классический театр, подобие классицизма. Да, это здорово, потому что мы, на самом деле, начали говорить об этом. Может быть, это может быть хорошая конкуренция, что то, что Саша сказал, что во время времени революции There is revolutionary experimental avant-garde theater, but then when the powers are consolidated, like in the Stalinist uh, 1930s, there is a return to classicism. <coughs> And the Soviet case, this is when socialist realism is codified. Uh, Because into such a pseudo-classical play, it is much easier to incorporate official ideology than into an avant-garde revolutionary play. This is what happens to Gladkov. Sasha, maybe it happens to Gladkov. Maybe it happens to Gladkov. Я давала интервью BBC, они спрашивали украинской редакции, как по вашему сейчас театр начинает служить государству, да, идеи войны. И естественно возникает государственный заказ на пьесы про оккупированные территории для населения оккупированных территорий, потому что это тоже важно. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Sasha was interviewed by the Ukrainian branch of the uh, BBC, and they were asking her how, in today's conditions, theater is beginning to serve the regime. And she said that of course there is now a new sense of commission where Putin's state commissions plays that deal with the war in Ukraine. Uh, of course, presenting it from the official Putin's perspective, not a uh, aggression, but rather uh, all these other lies that they say. This is me talking, but I think Sasha would agree. <laughs> Да, и, конечно, талантливые люди будут поставлены на службу, чтобы создавать талантливые произведения искусства, укрепляющие империю. And so talented people in Russia would serve the regime by creating talented works of art which actually enforce, fortify the regime. So, Sasha, нам, к сожалению, да. придется закончить. I'm saying that we unfortunately have to stop, although we could go on right for the rest of the afternoon because this is absolutely fascinating. Sasha, thank you for coming here and to enlighten us.